Divorced. Beheaded. Died. Divorced. Divorced. Beheaded. Survived. New York City, we are! In part one of our adventure through Henry VIII's tumultuous love life and his portrayals on the stage of Six the Musical, we went through the first three of his wives, noting that while their songs are catchy and fun, their representations don't go far into their own selves and mostly stick to telling Henry off, or proclaiming their love for him in the case of Darling Jane. I may or may not have complained about that, but realistically, it's only fair. I mean, Catherine of Aragon was married to him for nearly 24 years, Anne's involvement with him was kind of a big deal. And Jane barely had anything written about her before and after her marriage. Poor, poor Jane. The latter queens had interesting and well-reported lives before and after their marriages, in the case of the two that made it that far. So here we are, about halfway through the show, ready for the next queen, right? Back to the house! To the house of Hornby! Nope. Turns out that having six solos in a row might be a bit boring, so we get a break from them with the House of Holbein, a group number celebrating Hans Holbein the Younger, one of the most accomplished portraitists of the 16th century, who was taught the trade by his father, Hans Holbein the Elder, that is. His artwork was very much religious symmetry based, specifically on Roman Catholicism, but with the wave of religious reform hitting all of Europe at the time, well, he had to adapt it accordingly. Eventually, he'd move to London, working for Anne Boleyn and Thomas Cromwell, and soon enough, he'd become the King's Painter. During this time, he would draw some of his most famous paintings, including the Lost Whitehall Mural, portraying some grade-A Tudor propaganda, and The Ambassadors, a painting that has a spooky, scary secret skull when looked at from a certain angle. How fun. Throughout history, he's been thought to have painted all of Henry's wives to some capacity, but misidentifications happen, so we can only be sure he painted Boleyn, Seymour, and Anna of Cleves, alongside much of Henry's court. He painted, as shown in the musical, the options for Henry's fourth marriage. The first option, as shown in the musical, was Christina of Denmark, a 16-year-old Danish princess, the widowed Duchess of Milan. The musical implies that it was Henry who refused her tender left swipe style, but it was actually the other way around. You see, she realized that Henry's wife had that pesky habit of not staying alive for very long, including her great aunt Catherine of Aragon. And so Christina told him that she'd only marry him if she had two heads. Nice. Soon after, he traveled to the Holy Roman Empire to paint both Amalia and Anna of Cleves, but we'll get back to that in a second. House of Holbein also shows us some of the crazy beauty tips coming in fast from the 16th century, including super tight corsets, lead makeup, and dyeing your hair blonde through washing it with urine. This is all true, and if you don't trust me, trust horrible histories. Oh, don't worry, we we'll test all our products out on Shelly first, don't we, Shelly? <laughs> Yes, I'm calling her Anna instead of Anne. There's three Catherines, and I don't want to make it two Annes as well. Anna of Cleves, our German gal, infamous for deceiving the king with her supposedly inaccurate portrait. Or was that really it? The show seems to think so, portraying it as a catfish on Tinder type situation, but the truth is murkier than that. Anna was originally betrothed to Francis, heir of the Duchy of Lorraine, when they were very young, but this betrothal was cancelled before an actual marriage ever happened. So Anna was single and ready to mingle by the time Holbein came around to paint both her and her sister. They were both good options for marriage, but Anna was the option that both Henry and the Duke of Cleves, Anna's oldest brother, concluded was best, with Henry probably being interested in both her supposed appearance and her supposed personality, as he had been told particularly by Thomas. Cromwell that she was kind and gentle, not unlike Jane. You see, France and the Holy Roman Empire, Henry's two biggest political rivals, had now teamed up and he needed a political boost ASAP. Seeing as Anna's family had also banished papal authority from their domain, them coming together only made sense and Thomas Cromwell was particularly in support of it. Soon Anna would be on her way to London to meet her future husband, 
Unfortunately, she didn't know what Henry had in mind as a surprise during one of her stops. Halfway through New Year's Day, before they were supposed to have met, he would, in disguise, burst into the room and kiss her, and true love would mean that she would recognize him instantly. She did not. Yeah, it wasn't a good start. One thing to note here is that Anna was not a traditional lady by English terms. Though she was supposedly very skilled with needlework, she had received no quote-unquote proper education, and she could only read and write in German, which is not the most romantic language. Papio. Butterfly. Mariposa. Schmetterling! She was also quite tall and strong-featured, a departure from Henry's previous wives. She really was a Wiener Schnitzel, not an English flower, and this probably only put Henry off further. When it came to her appearance, Henry was by far the biggest attractor. <laughs> Feeling especially annoyed at the supposed cat fishing that had been done to him. However, it should be mentioned that there really aren't that many reports that corroborate her quote-unquote ugliness, and her nickname of the Flanders Mare was only popularized after anyone who had seen her in person would have died. There are multiple outside reasons that might have motivated his distaste, including the diminishing benefits of an alliance between him and her family. Despite the groom's attempts to stop the wedding and even Anna herself arriving late, the not-so-happy couple got married and the wedding night went about as well as you'd expect and the honeymoon period was over before it even begun. Henry was too turned off by her, Anna pretended not to know, or actually didn't know her queenly duties, and Thomas Cromwell, well, he was too scared to say anything. The whole situation was just one heaping pile of awkwardness for all involved, worse than still by Henry's wandering eyes wandering right over to yet another lady-in-waiting, who will soon be our fifth queen. In less than seven months, the whole house of cards would fall apart, with Cromwell being arrested for various BS charges from leading conservatives, and a divorce between Anna and Henry being soon underway, on the admittedly flimsy grounds of it not having been consummated and her having been previously betrothed. Anna, although initially distraught by Henry basically just sending divorce papers over to her, did not protest too much, an undeniably smart move all things considered. She would come out in a very good position, receiving multiple properties, including Richmond Palace, her usual residence from then on, as well as an annual income, and her and Henry's relationship would actually become better from here on out, with her becoming an honorary part of Henry's family and being called the King's beloved sister. Anna would live a pretty good life from here on out, never remarrying and never returning to Cleves. She'd even accept Catherine Howard as the new queen a few months after her divorce. Funnily enough, after Catherine's untimely demise, there would be an attempt to remarry Anna and Henry, which he gracefully refused. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. Anna was also particularly close to Elizabeth Tudor, though Henry's other children weren't really big fans, with Edward reclaiming some of her castles during his reign and Mary being paranoid about Anna and Elizabeth teaming up to get rid of her. Oh, Mary. She would pass away in 1557, likely due to cancer, being fondly remembered by those who served her and receiving a grand funeral, courtesy of Mary. Though she passed at only 41 years of age, she was actually the last of the six wives to die and outlived Henry by 10 years, even outliving young Edward VI. Anna is arguably the one whose role in sex is the most comforting, going against the idea that her losing the crown was a tragedy for her, and showing that she was savvy enough to put any contempt to Henry aside in order to live a good and decently long life. Even the creators of the show itself love her story because of its decently happy ending. Her song Get Down is unique amongst the other solos because it focuses on her life post-Henry, since she's the only one who had a full life post-Henry. It describes her lavish lifestyle as one of England's richest women at the time, and celebrates her victory in the eyes of history. I personally couldn't find any information as to whether she hung up her portrait or not, but if any of you know, please feel free to comment. One thing that Six does not mention is that the only real account we have of Anna's ugliness is Henry himself, 
and he is the definition of an unreliable narrator. And going off of that idea without really contesting it at all, well, it does a bit of a disservice to Anna. So, uh, Catherine Howard's story is not as fun as Anne of Cleves, unfortunately. Catherine Howard already started her life in a rough spot, with her father relying on his richer relatives to get by, and her mother passing when she was but a young child. She would live with her step-grandmother, Agnes Howard, the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk, in a sort of boarding school for girls situation, where she was supposed to become educated and fit to marry whoever her family wished. Unfortunately, Agnes was both a shitty caretaker and a shitty judge of character, especially when it came to employees. Exhibit A, Henry Mannix. His exact age at the time of their interactions is unknown, ranging from early 20s to late 30s, Catherine was 13 at the time. The details about this relationship, aside from how inappropriate it was, even for that time period, have been lost to time. But they break up a year or two afterwards, supposedly with Agnes catching the two in the act. She would blame both of them, but keep Mannix employed. Shitty caretaker indeed. Women gotta stick together. We also have Exhibit B. Francis Derham, the Duchess's secretary and a Howard cousin. He was either in his late 20s or his early 30s, and Catherine was 14 at the time. According to her later statements, this relationship was based on him forcing himself upon her, and it got to the point where the two called each other husband and wife. It was a known secret amongst the house staff, but it took a jealous manic sending a letter to Agnes for her to find out about it. Thankfully, Agnes would send him off, and she'd tell Catherine to stop in fear that it would hurt her beauty. Whatever that means. Her uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, would eventually get her a place in Henry's court as one of Anna's ladies-in-waiting. And Henry, in his usual MO, would soon become interested in her. You see, she was a cousin to both Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour, so in Henry's eyes, she must have had them good genes, especially when compared to Anna. Not only that, but she was also extremely young, being in her late teens in comparison to Henry's late forties. In fact, she was actually younger than his first daughter, Mary. She's my age. Did she tell you that? How would you feel if your father married someone who was your age? Pushing this relationship was the aforementioned Duke of Norfolk, as well as the Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, who thought that a match between the two would help bring Roman Catholicism back to England. During her time in Henry's court, she'd become close to one of his courtiers, Thomas Culpepper, a distant cousin of hers. This would go so far as there being rumors of the two potentially wanting to marry each other, which, if true, never got to happen, because Henry decided soon enough that Catherine would be his next wife. Their wedding occurred on the same day that Thomas Cromwell was executed, a fate that was undoubtedly influenced by the failure of Henry's previous marriage. His and Catherine's marriage, however, for the most part, seemed decently positive. He would shower her with extravagant gifts and would at least in part listen to her, as she was able to convince him to release three of Cromwell's close associates and supposedly helped normalize the relationships between Henry's three children. As queen, however, she would, in an odd move, actually appoint Francis Derham as her secretary. There is no definitive explanation as to why she did this, but she'd later say that it was due to Agnes's insistence. During a tour of the North with Henry, she'd send Thomas Culpepper a letter that would become one of the most damning pieces of evidence against her. Now, this letter admittedly does show much fondness and implies that the two were actually secretly meeting with the help of Jane Boleyn, George Boleyn's widow, who you'd think would know better at this point. The contents of it could mean anything from them having an affair, to them just being really close friends, to him potentially blackmailing her with the knowledge of her past. Culpepper would admit, under torture, that he had romantic interests in her, and that she wanted him in the same way, but she never admitted it herself. And this is not to mention that Culpepper had himself a few allegations of unsavory behavior under his belt. According to a merchant's letter, he had assaulted a peasant woman and killed a man in the process, charges he seemingly got away from due to his close connection with the king. However, Thomas Culpepper had a brother called Thomas Culpepper the Elder, so the letter could be in reference to him. Who knows? Soon enough, rumors of Catherine's past would appear. Mary Hall, a gentlewoman from Agnes Howard's household, would tell her brother, a religious reformer, about Catherine's quote-unquote light behavior as a young teenager. 
Archbishop Cranmer would soon catch wind of these rumors, and would tell them to Henry through a secret letter. Catherine's house of cards quickly fell from here on out. Henry would secretly leave for London without her, and Mannix, Steerham, and even Culpepper were now being interrogated slash tortured. Even Jane Boleyn was being interrogated, expectedly blaming Catherine and Thomas for getting her involved in their affair. As the metaphorical axe hanging over Catherine's head was quickly becoming a literal one, she would write three confessions to Henry, since Cranmer convinced her that he could show her mercy if she did, but to no avail. The charges pulled through, and she, alongside Jane Boleyn, Culpepper, and Derham, were all found guilty of high treason, with the former three being sentenced to decapitation, and the latter being hanged, drawn, and quartered. And no, neither Agnes nor Mannix were particularly punished for it either. Catherine's behavior in her final weeks was erratic, first showing denial by enjoying her remaining luxuries, followed by resisting being moved to the Tower of London as her execution was nearing, to acceptance when told it would be happening the following day, even practicing placing her head on the block. Her final words are subject to some contention, as some say it was, I die a queen, but I would rather die the wife of Thomas Culpepper. But as eyewitness Otwell Johnson explains, she stuck to traditional final words about deserving her fate. Catherine was only 19 at the time of her death, and her body was buried in an unmarked grave in the same site as Anne and George Boleyn's. Howard's portrayal in Six provides a stark contrast to Anne of Cleves, as the show transitions from the most successful queen to arguably the biggest victim of the story. Fortunately, the musical foregoes more traditional interpretations of her as just a silly little slut, and instead uses her solo, All You Wanna Do, to look at how she, a young girl who didn't even make it to 20 years of age, was continually taken advantage of by the men around her. According to creator Lucy Moss, I had an idea of how I wanted to demonstrate that she isn't this kind of air-headed, slutty teenager, but she's actually an abused child. This choice is perfectly supported by portraying Howard in appearance and genre as a sexualized teenage pop star, with particular inspirations from Ariana Grande and Britney Spears. Good girls gone bad. Yeah! Woo! Her solo does not mention, however, how unsupportive the women around Catherine were. Now this would deviate a bit from the point of the song, it would show how just misogynistic society was at that point. While she could argue that we can't look back at the past with today's standards in mind, it's impossible to blame Catherine for what she went through, especially if you consider the possibility of her and Culpepper's supposed affair being either platonic or based on blackmail. It's impossible to know the exact details of her life, as is the case with all these women, but it's a breath of fresh air to see Catherine Howard portrayed sympathetically, if nothing else. Survive. Catherine Parr was born into a knightly family that had gone to the top through successful marriages and royal favor. Though her father, who was a friend of Henry's, died when she was only six years old, she was particularly close to her mother, a lady in waiting to Catherine of Aragon, which was likely where Catherine's name came from. As a 17-year-old, she married Sir Edward Burra, but this marriage only lasted four years and bore no children, as he died from natural causes in his 20s. Only one year after his death, she'd marry John Neville, a man in his 40s. He was a staunch supporter of the Catholic Church, while Catherine herself was a Protestant by this time. He was actually part of the Pilgrimage of Grace, which I mentioned in part one of this series. And while he wasn't really punished for it, his and his family's reputation took quite a beating from this. His health would worsen from then on, and he'd eventually die of natural causes in 1543. I guess that's a bit of a recurring theme in her story. As her mother had been close to Catherine of Aragon, Parr would strike up a friendship at this time with Mary Tudor. Whether it was through Mary or through Parr's own family, she and Henry would meet, and soon enough, he'd propose to her, potentially finding her a suitable match as she would know how to be a good wife. Even though she hadn't given birth to any children in either of her previous marriages, perhaps this signaled a change in Henry's mindset. Perhaps in his old age, having another heir just didn't matter as much. Now, marrying Henry at this point, him having a festering wound and gout and scurvy and potentially syphilis, wasn't as attractive an idea as it once was, 
But to make matters worse, Parr was in love with someone else. Escándalo. Just a few years earlier, she had met Thomas Seymour, brother to Jane Seymour, and the two had become quite close to one another, to the point where he proposed to her. However, caught between the two men, she'd accept Henry's proposal and reject Thomas's, supposedly considering it one of her godly duties. Catherine goes, okay, I'll do my best. And Henry goes, I hope so, because I don't know what my genitals are doing, they've been dead for years. Their wedding was a small affair, and Thomas would be sent to Brussels as an ambassador for England. Whether it was his own choice or Henry's, we don't know. As all of Henry's relationships, it was good at the start. Not only did Catherine act as a dutiful wife to Henry, lack of pregnancies aside, but she also helped bring both Mary and Elizabeth back into the line of succession, and the Tudor family finally seemed like a happy one. However, peace was stirred through Catherine's religious views. As then a Protestant and Henry's court decided to investigate her and many of her ladies-in-waiting for potentially spreading evangelical propaganda. You see, Henry's form of Protestantism wasn't really so much Protestantism as a weird mix between that and Roman Catholicism. Luckily for Parr, she found out about this investigation before it progressed any further and was successful in begging Henry to forgive her. This was so timely that literally the next day, a guard tried to arrest her, not knowing that she had been pardoned. This marks basically the one time that Henry actually forgave gave one of his wives for her supposed wrongdoings, though who knows whether it was due to him just being tired of going through the whole execution thing again, or through their relationship being that strong. Their marriage would only last one more year after this, with Henry passing on what would have been his father's 90th birthday on January 28th, 1547. Despite her close relationship to Edward, the role of regent would go to Edward Seymour, Jane's other brother, who would then become Lord Protector. But it wasn't all bad news for Parr. Thomas Seymour soon returned to court, and he proposed to her once more, which she was now finally free to accept. Fairy tale ending, right? Oh no, because this is real life and no one ever gets to be happy. Their wedding was a small affair, held only a few months after Henry's death, and would cause quite a ruckus, especially among the Seymours. Edward and Thomas would fight for control over the young King Henry. King Henward? Edward and Thomas would fight for control over the young king, who, alongside Mary, would now distance himself from Parr. Parr would have a rivalry with her brother-in-law's wife over the king's wife's jewels, which she'd eventually have to concede over to her since she was now the Lord Protector's wife. On the plus side, Parr would soon become pregnant. I do desire, your highness, to keep the little knave so lean and gaunt with your good diet and walking, that he may be so small that he creep out of a mouse hole. And young Elizabeth Tudor would also move in with her. Happy news, except that this is reality and nothing can ever end happily. Turns out that Thomas had, between Henry's death and his second proposal to Parr, actually proposed to Elizabeth, an offer she refused due to the nearly 30 year difference between them. This pursuit didn't end there, however, as while the three lived together, he reportedly would oftentimes visit Elizabeth and engage in horseplay, occasionally alongside Parr. In case you're like me and didn't really know what horseplay meant, well, it's not as bad as it sounds. However, these occasions, as described by Elizabeth's servants, still sound really, really fishy. You could say, uh, yeah, it was normal for the time. But the fact that these situations raise these people's concerns, well, I think it shows enough. Allegedly, one day Parr caught the two genuinely embracing one another, and the very next day, Elizabeth had left. Whether it was Parr's or Elizabeth's choice, we'll never know. But the two actually kept in contact after this, so... No harsh feelings, I guess. Parr would soon give birth to a baby girl, Mary Seymour, named after Mary Tudor. Unfortunately, much like Jane Seymour before her, Catherine's health would soon fail, and she'd pass away days later, only outliving Henry by less than two years and receiving the first Protestant burial of an English queen. The child would soon become an orphan, as Thomas would be executed for a plot to make himself king by getting Edward out of the picture and marrying Elizabeth. What a guy. What happened to their daughter after this is unknown. Her 
character on the show, obviously based off of Alicia Keys in appearance and musical style, is the one with the smallest presence, until her big solo, I Don't Need Your Love, which is all about how heartbreaking it was to refuse the man she truly loved and instead marry Henry. A sentiment that's not quite as powerful when you find out more about the guy. It frames itself as a letter of rejection to him, though the only letters we have between the two of them are from after Henry's death. Parr provides some introspectiveness to the show, prompting it to address how these women's only historical value known to the public is their relationships with Henry. The show elaborates on some of her achievements, such as her having written three books, the first two being translated and altered pre-existing works, and the latter being entirely original. Though the show's claim of having a female artist paint her picture is a bit iffy, though one of her most famous pictures is by an unknown artist, and one of her closest ladies-in-waiting was a female artist, so... maybe? Either way, it doesn't really mention how she kind of set the stage for the next 50 years of the British monarchy. Not only did she bring Mary and Elizabeth back into the succession line, but she also clearly inspired Elizabeth's Protestant beliefs and the way she would govern as queen, having likely been inspired by Parr's successful regency while Henry was campaigning in France. Parr was one smart cookie, both in scholarly pursuits and in maneuvering her way through the misogynistic society of her time and through Henry's perilous court, which I think adds to her claim of being the survivor of the lot even if she didn't outlive Henry by particularly that much. Six is a fun show. It's bouncy, energetic, bright, and all around a good time. However, it is only a microcosm of these women's lives. I mean, obviously they never formed a girl group, but still. It provides an interesting adaptation of their stories, taking and even embracing the public's perceptions of them to some degree, but also increasing awareness of interesting parts of their lives that might not be known to the general public, from Howard's personal abuse to Anna's success post-marriage. If nothing else, it succeeds in its original mission of righting some historical wrongs and adding some depth to these women. It also succeeds in something that's very important for historical theater and media in general to do. It makes us curious. It makes us want to learn more about the people that it's talking about. Help. even this video is an example of that. Lots of fascinating parts about these women's lives had to be left in the cutting room in order to streamline their songs, which is fair enough considering the show's barely an hour long. Not only that, but sometimes it takes possibilities as facts in order to push the narrative forward, like Anne flirting around or Parr's picture being painted by a woman. It also neglects the pretty fascinating Catholicism versus Protestantism conflict that permeated all of Henry's relationships to some capacity and which only really ended with Elizabeth I, who said she didn't care about people's religions as long as they served her. What an icon. But ultimately, much like Hamilton did for its title character, Six has brought its protagonist into the foreground and added much more public interest to them. It may not be entirely accurate, but it does its job, and I think we can all appreciate a fun, semi-educational time. Thank you so, so much for watching this. This was quite an adventure. I hope you enjoyed watching it. I actually have more appreciation for the show now that I've done all this, and I hope you do too. And happy 2021, everyone. We have videos coming out soon. I think Jack will post some uh, trailers sooner or later, but don't tell him I told you. Oh my god! Oh my god! Help me! Help me! He's come for me! And that's a wrap. Ah!